Welcome everyone, thank you so much for coming. I was so impressed at the great turnout I got from the ILR students, and there's a class coming, so they'll just have to come when, when they can get here. I want you to know that this event is the first of three events sponsored by the Center for Peace, Justice, and Reconciliation. You can see the logo with the dove in the upper right. This particular event is, was presented, comes to you from myself, Beverly Margolis, and my colleague, Dr. Sarah Schertz. She couldn't be here today, she's a professor in Lyndhurst, but without her help, this would not be happening. And this event is the first of three events for this week and next. So today is Iris Dorbian's talk, this Wednesday, we have Simon Jerichim, he's a Holocaust survivor. And next Monday, we have Chris Nicola, who's a cave explorer, who discovered personal items while exploring a cave in the Ukraine, and spent 10 years researching to find the survivors who were hiding in this cave for 500 days and interviewing them another 10 years to produce a documentary and a and a book about them. And we have them in the bookstore. We have books also for our survivor on Wednesday. And we can't hold these events without help from uh, organizations within Bergen and beyond. In this case, the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education has been a big part of our events. Oh, and we thank the Office of Student Life for the delicious pastries in the back. I am one member of a team of seven. At the top is our founding directors, Tom LaPointe and David Eichenholz. And at the bottom are the rest of the team. And in addition to be members of the Center for Peace Justice and putting on events within the campus, we also have a speaker a speakers bureau, and I had founded the speakers bureau with the intent that the next generation could continue the voices of the survivors. And I'm a child of survivors, so I go out to high schools and other organizations. We don't charge anything, and we do talks, half hour, an hour, um, whatever is requested. So typically for Yom HaShoah or um, some other event, were requested, and we have a website. Okay, the website, hang on. Okay, this is our website, bergen.edu slash PJR for Peace, Justice, Reconciliation. If you go to our site, and there's an events link on the left-hand side, and you can see what's coming, because there's too many events for me to mention. I'm just mentioning the three Holocaust Remembrance events. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today. We have Iris Dorbian. She is a professional journalist, author, editor, blogger, extraordinaire. And she's also the daughter, granddaughter, and niece of Holocaust survivors. So I will allow her to take it over. Welcome. Okay. Minimize this one. And is this how you want to do it? I mean, I could bring it up like when I'm done. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, well, you know, well, actually, I'll. Because okay. I need to see my, my emails. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Let me introduce myself. Uh, thank you, Beverly. Again, I'm Iris Storbian. I'm a professional journalist, uh, author, editor, essayist, and blogger, and I'm also the granddaughter, daughter, and niece of Holocaust survivors. I can't remember a time when I wasn't aware of my father, Hirsch Dorbian. Um, he's the little boy in that photo. And he's, he's, uh, he's sitting on the knee of my grandmother, and that was taken in the 1930s. And he's flanked by my, uh, my aunts, my father's older sisters, Sila, 
was a very serious one over there, um, and Reva, the other one. They're both alive. Okay. I can't remember when I wasn't aware of my father, Hirsch Dorbian, being a Holocaust survivor. And yet, for a long time, my father wasn't exactly keen on sharing his Holocaust experiences with strangers, even with those who were among his friends and family. A lot of that had, later on as he got older, dad started to open up to a point. He still wouldn't speak at schools or classes when people would invite him to speak. A lot of that had to do with his naturally shy, reserved nature. But mostly, it was too painful and traumatic, made more so by the fact that he was only a child, 12 years old, when the nightmare began for him. A survivor of various concentration camps, which included Stutthof and Stolp, Dad was liberated by British forces on May 3rd, 1945 five days before VE Day, which marked the official end of World War II in Europe. He spent the next six months in a hospital in Neustadt-Holstein, in the British zone of partition Germany. As close as we were, I remember when I was very young, feeling very frustrated by what I perceived to be my father's closed off, emotionally unavailable behavior. I loved him, and I knew he loved me. His eyes would always light up and shine whenever I'd enter a room, making me feel how important and special I was to him. But there was a wall between himself and most of the world, a fortress that he had built out of self-preservation, one that few could ever successfully breach. It was only as I got older that I realized how so much of my father's behavior had its roots in what happened to him in the camps. In the meantime, I grew up thinking that the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder that my father would regularly exhibit, the crippling insomnia alternating with nightmares that would consist of dad or his loved ones being chased by Nazis were perfectly normal. I had also grown used to his intense fear of being left alone, as well as his fear of the dark, which had its origin when he, his mother, and two older sisters were arrested by the SS in the middle of the night in their hometown of Libau, Latvia. From there, they were sent to Kaiserwald, a concentration camp in Riga, the capital of Latvia. In addition to the horror of being in a concentration camp, never knowing if each day would be his last. What especially traumatized my father were the circumstances, the memories of the circumstances leading up to his liberation. In March 1945, when it was apparent the Germans were losing and the Allies were approaching, the SS evacuated Stutthof, the last concentration camp my father had been in. Though ill with fever, Dad forced himself to go on this march. Not to go meant being left behind, which spelled certain death. After a few weeks of marching to nowhere, the SS forced my father and the others onto a barge where the destination was unknown. As my father related to the late historian Martin Gilbert for a book Gilbert was writing about the E-Day, the days leading up to liberation were beyond grim. And this part of the letter, which I'm about to read, was incorporated in the Gilbert book, which is entitled, The Day the War Ended. On May 3rd, 1945, we landed on the outskirts of Neustadt-Holstein, where the guards abandoned us, leaving us stranded about three miles from shore. Fortunately for us, we had Norwegian and Danish prisoners with seafaring experience aboard. They were able to rig up some sort of sail, which enabled us to get within walking distance to shore. With their help, the sick and weak were first to disembark. I was one who disembarked early. I remember being put down by a tree where I was able to witness the other people getting off the boat. Then suddenly out of nowhere, the guards reappeared, yelling and screaming that no one gave orders to disembark. They started shooting at people still on deck 
waiting to go down the makeshift gangplank. Hundreds were killed like that, only a few hours before liberation. When the shooting stopped, those who survived were left off the barge, gathered up, and marched to the town of Neustadt-Holstein. There we were brought to a large naval base which had formerly been used as a submarine base. Then we were taken and left on a soccer field. A few hours later, the Germans rounded us up again. By this time, the British tanks were already on the next road, but the Germans still tried to march us on. The next day, the British medics took me to the hospital where I spent the next seven months of my life. I stayed in Germany in a displaced persons camp in Neustadt-Holstein until August 1949, when I was finally given permission to join relatives in the United States. And by the way, my father was 14 when he was liberated. Sometimes when dad would share some of these horrific Holocaust experiences, he would use this matter-of-fact tone that was as jarring to me as the experiences he was recalling. I remember years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I was telling Dad about a Russian novel I was reading, and there was a character in there named Ivan, which is a very common Russian name. I mentioned this to Dad, and he responded with a deadpan expression, I knew an Ivan once, in camp. He was a nice guy. He was hanged. The next minute, his emotionally inert, deadpan expression shifted to one of paternal concern as he asked me what I wanted to order while we sat in our favorite diner. You can imagine my expression. Often, when I would be going through with what I consider to be a rough patch in my life, I'd think about what dad went through, and I'd feel guilty. How dare I get so upset over something that next to what dad went through was so stupid, so trivial, so inconsequential. To make up for what my father went through, I overcompensated and became a bit of an overachiever. And every time something good would happen to me, either academically or professionally, instantly I would think of what dad went through and I would use my success as a way to counter the monstrous, grievous wrongs that had been done to a young boy who had done nothing wrong other than being Jewish. Still, I would always try to understand and forge some meaning to something that was always out of my reach. I remember when I was in journalism school in the late 1990s. I devoted my master's project on, quote, post-traumatic stress disorder among Holocaust survivors and its effects on their offspring. Why didn't they go to therapy? It was a topic I had always pondered, and this class project gave me the perfect excuse to fully explore and answer this question. In addition to my father and several family friends who were also survivors, I interviewed my older brother. I asked him how the symptoms of dad's trauma had affected him. I brought up the insomnia, uh, the nightmares, the phobias. My brother dismissed it saying, everybody has insomnia and those fears. I realized then that my brother's way of not dealing with my father's trauma was the only way he could deal with it. I also interviewed a self-described traumatologist who specialized in treating both survivors and their children. She told me that the reason why survivors, like my father, did not go to therapy the way we regularly do when we experience something difficult or painful in our lives, or simply because we want to develop perspective on behavior we might find problematic, is that the idea of psychiatry or therapy was not acceptable to my father's generation. Only crazy or mentally ill people went to psychiatrists. Yes, <laughs> and like what the traumatologist told me, survivors weren't crazy. They were traumatized. After my father's death on October 15th, 2010, I started writing more about my dad and his Holocaust experiences 
and the effects his trauma had on me. Because I'm a writer, it made sense that I would turn to words, my stock and trade, the currency I use to express myself to the world, to heal from a grief over a loss that was still so raw and so deep. It was also my way of healing this painful intergenerational legacy that began 75 years ago in the camps. The first thing I wrote after my father's death that dealt with his Holocaust experiences was a personal essay entitled A Prayer in Times Square, which was published in July 2013 by a literary journal. I wrote this essay when I was still living in New York City, where I had lived for 30 years since college and graduate school. In the essay, I learned from my mother that my father's latest operation was not successful, that his cancer had not only returned, but had spread to his major organs. And it was a matter of time, a few weeks, even days, that he would die. While remembering the highlights of our relationship, I was struggling to come to terms with his imminent death, as well as this legacy of being a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. In this short excerpt, taken from that same essay, I talk about my father's final hours and how, even near death, he could not escape the Holocaust. When I arrived at my childhood home that October, Monday morning, I knew Dad would die. The question was when. He was no longer lucid, and when he was able to formulate and voice complete sentences, he was not in the present, but jumping to various points in his life working as a tool and die maker at a plant in Patterson, having a ringside seat at my brother's bitter divorce from his ex, and suffering and starving in the camps. For each period he would travel to, he spoke in the language he primarily used for that time, Yiddish and or German for the World War II chapter in his life, and English for the most the United States era. It was excruciating watching Dad relapse into his Holocaust period. From his hospice bed, he bellowed in Yiddish, people are screaming, they're being beaten, what should I do? He uttered this as the life force was ebbing away from him. All I could think was, when will this stop already? I went back home the next day to New York City after my mother urged me to go. There was nothing more any of us could do except wait. The next morning, I got word that Dad had died, peacefully, hours earlier. Immediately, I went home to New Jersey and prepared for the Shiva, the week-long Jewish period of mourning. While this was going on, I recalled the conversation Dad and I had earlier in the year. You're going to live a long life, Iris, Dad said to me one fine spring afternoon, six months before he died. I know it. We were strolling in our far favorite park, talking about everything under the sun, just like we always had. After a miserably long and seemingly interminable winter, flowers were starting to bud. Then Dad made his prediction about my longevity. The verdict is still out on that one. <laughs> but was his prediction something he needed to believe in knowing he would only have a short time left before the cancer would finally kill him. Or maybe it was his way of urging me to honor his legacy after he died. I think it was both. And honor his legacy, I've chosen to do. Thank you. Now, I just want to show you a, a montage of photographs <laughs> uh, taken from significant periods in my father's life. And also included in these photographs are two very interesting documents from my father's DP camp years. Okay. So this photo, like I said in the beginning, this is taken in, I'd say, like 1933? Yeah. 1930? Okay, okay, because I'm not, yeah. So this photograph is taken 1933, um, I would say. This is my mother. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my grandmother. She died in 1981. She was 92. That was my father. He was like about two years old. And uh, he's flanked by his sisters. 
um, who are still very much alive. That's Sila, who's on your left, the one who's seated. She lives in Rio de Janeiro. She's 94 years old. And the other sister who's standing with the dark page boy, that's Riva. She's 52, and she's very much alive, and she lives in Fairlawn. And that's my father. He died a month shy of his 80th birthday on October 15th, 2010. Okay. This shot was taken, I say, 1946 or 47. This, he's in the DP camp. And he's wearing clothes that was given to him by the Jewish Distribution Committee. I mean, they're kind of big on him. He's about like 16 years old. And you see, he's happy. He's smiling. He looks healthy. Because it's, you know, it's been about a year over since he's been um, liberated. Also, he was, liber he was reunited with his mother and his sister at this point. They had been forcibly separated uh, when they had been arrested and uh, taken to Kaiserwald. And the thing that's really quite remarkable was that his immediate family, which consisted of his mother and his two sisters, they survived. Now, his father had died of an illness in 1935, so his father actually did not go through that. But here he is, and I'll show you in a, in a bit just his DP camp photo, which was taken just right after he got out of the hospital. And it's such a difference. It's just a year, and he looks, um, he doesn't look like this. He, he still looks sick like, but anyway. All right, here's some just family shots. <laughs> That's my father and me. <laughs> The one on the left, I'm with him, this baby, and this word Patterson. And the shot on the right is probably one of the last shots of me with my father. This was taken in 2009. Yeah, we were, going to, we were going to Temple. Yeah, we were going to Temple on uh, either Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. And this was in Fairlawn. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the shots um, on the right, top and bottom, my father was a tool and die maker, and he learned that trade uh, while he was in the DP camp. Ort had set up a vocational program, for, they did this for a lot of these survivors, and he learned that trade, and um, when he came to this country, he, he worked as a machinist, tool and die maker, and later on he became a foreman in the tool and die factory that he worked at, at in Patterson. And the shot below, that black and white shot, that's taken, that's like, I guess that's the late 70s, late 70s. No, no, you know, so no, actually, I'm sorry. Um, that's like the late 60s, early 70s. And um, that's in Patterson. He worked for Universal Manufacturing. And above, that shot where he was kind of, he was semi-retired at that point, but he, um, he was working as a machinist for a plant in Fairlawn. That's like the early 2000s. And that shot <laughs> on your left, that's my father, that's me, my mother, who's sitting right over there, and my nephews, my little, who are grown men in their 20s, they're in the foreground. That's when I, I graduated from Columbia Journalism School. My, they, my parents threw me a party. So, all right. This is an interesting shot. Here's dad as a Marine. <laughs> yes, um, from the camps to the Marine Corps. Uh, oh, this, he did not willingly enlist in the Marine Corps, okay? Uh, I know some members of my father's family think that he did. He did not. He was, he came to this country in 1949. He was a young man, 18 going on 19. He turned 19 in November. The Korean War broke out in the early 50s. Because he was of draftable age, he received a draft notice, but he wasn't a citizen yet. So he went to the Army Recruitment Center, Times Square, and he brought up the fact that he wasn't a citizen, and did he have to serve? And the recruiter said, well, you don't have to serve, but that doesn't mean we won't start deportation proceedings against you. <laughs> but while he was there, and this sounds like so cliched, a representative of the Marine Corps was there. And he told this recruiter that he literally, he needed a few good men. And the recruiter said, go on and pick. And he picked, my father was one of those whom he picked. So that's how he ended up in uh, Camp Lejeune in Paris Island. <laughs> But 
his citizenship was, was fast-tracked while he was in the court. And also, here's a very interesting story. Uh, early on, uh, when he was in boot camp, uh, I don't remember if he told me if it was the, uh, oh, uh, who it exactly it was, um, but someone, well, somebody, uh, oh, I don't know if it was the drill instructor or someone else, maybe, okay, I'll say it was the drill instructor, but he was berating the men, telling them they don't know how good they have it, being Americans. You want to know how good you have it? Ask Dorbian. He'll tell you how good you have it. And it was then that my dad realized that he looked at his records and he knew that my dad was in a, had been in a concentration camp. Here it is. All right. This is from the DP camp. OK. You see, that's the photo of my father. He was 14 years old. Um, that was uh, issued by the, uh, the Jewish Council in Neustadt-Holstein. Neustadt-Holstein was in the British zone of partition Germany. And um, the DPs were, they had to have IDs, or they called it Ausweis in, in German. And, uh, and you'll see that's the photo of my father when he was 14. And just compare it to the earlier shot you saw of my dad with the calf, and he has the smile, and he looks healthy. This is just a year difference. And here he is. He looks haunted and still sickly. And this is um, about seven months after liberation. He was just discharged after the hospital. And when he was, was liberated, he had all sorts of illnesses. He had typh typhus, he had dysentery. So, um, so there's the ID. And also, and you see on the left, that is the uh, paper that he filled out <coughs> indicating his desire to emigrate. Now, it took him and his family about four years uh, to get permission to emigrate. And that was facilitated by President Truman signing the Displaced Persons Act, which enabled 100,000 DPs from Europe to emigrate to this country without a quota. And that's really how my dad and his family got in. Plus, they did have sponsorship from relatives in Patterson. And this is just <laughs> this is a shot of this is just a shot of me and my brother um, at one of these Woolworths photo instamatic boots. I just thought it was adorable. You see, there's my, my dad. My dad is a father. That's my older brother. So, okay, <laughs> yes, okay. So, uh, do you have any questions? Yes. I, I answered all their questions. Oh. In a letter off easy. So, did your dad, um, when he was in the DP camp, do you know what they did, or from who had this going to change? Yes, he learned, yes. He learned how to become a machinist right. in the DP camp. ORT, um, I don't know what they stand for, ORT. Organization. Oh, yes, 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 exactly, yeah. They, they set it up. Rehabilitation and training? Yes, 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 because I, 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 I know it by the acronym, but I, I don't know what it's Yes, they set it up, the, the program that would um, train various DPs in various occupations. Yes? Great question, great question, great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I actually, I, uh, I wrote a novel, the coming of age novel that was set in a DP camp that was inspired by my father's Holocaust experiences, where I touch upon that, because that's, a, and it's, it's right now, it's, it's called An Epiphany in Lilacs in the Aftermath of the Camps. And um, right now, um, you can get it, but a used copy, because I have an agent representing that book, so she's, she's trying to resell it to a larger publisher, but, I'm answer, going to answer your question. Um, what happened? Okay. My father, um, most of my father's family had been killed in the roundups in Latvia. Now, his mother, uh, when you saw her, she had good papers. She worked at a naval base in, uh, in Latvia, and uh, that enabled her to basically save her family during the initial roundups. Um, my father had an aunt, okay, most of her, uh, my father had an aunt, her sister, who lived in Berlin, Tante Ida. 
And she was Jewish, and she was married to a German, and German Lutheran, and he refused to divorce her in accordance with the Nuremberg Laws, which banned intermarriage between Jews and Gentiles. And because of that, she was put under house arrest, and she was, she was never sent to a concentration camp. Now, my father knew her address. He knew it from his head because my, my grandmother, whom we called Baba, she was always writing letters to her. So after he got out of the hospital and he had recovered and you know, he was in the DP camp, he was looking for his mother and his two sisters to find out if they had survived. Um, so he decided, he, he thought pretty much that maybe Tante Ida was still alive in Berlin. He knew her address, so he had a friend of his um, transcribe a letter to her, asking, um, a letter in German, asking her if she had heard from his mother and his two sisters and, and telling her that he had survived. Well, when she got that letter, and actually it took a couple of weeks, it's because it, um, Germany was partitioned at this point, and that was in the British zone, but there was also the American zone, and there was also the Russian zone, and uh, Tante Ida was in the Russian zone, and they were uh, really vetting the mail and everything, so it took a while before you would get something sent to the, the Russian zone. But she got the letter, and sure enough, my, my grandmother and my aunt and, and the man, who would soon be my uncle, uh, were there, and they saw it. And, and at this point, by the way, my, my other aunt, Sila, she, uh, she got married and she went to, um, she was in France because her husband wanted to um, emigrate to Rio de Janeiro. And the only way you can get a visa is to establish residency in um, France. That, that's why she wasn't there. But Riva, my grandmother, and my uncle were there. So they saw the letter and um, they, my aunt and my uncle decided they were, they were gonna go there and check it out. And they, they, they got to the DP camp and they found out that there was a performance that was going on. And my father had a wonderful voice. He had a really beautiful voice. And he, he, he sang in a choir in Latvia. And he also, he also did sing a little bit in, in camps, believe it or not, because um, that would help him get more money. And also, there was a, a gentleman there who knew that my dad could sing. And, and he would put on these little reviews. Sure enough, the same one put on these little reviews in the DP camp, and Dad was singing. And le family legend has it that um, while my dad was singing, he saw this strange young woman draw closer and closer and closer and closer to him to the point where finally he recognized her. Mm -hmm. So they reunited during the middle of the performance. Thank you, that's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's a true story. Yes. First, I want to thank you, not only for the content, but you're a very gifted uh, presenter. Oh. And, uh, I'm sure everybody looking around felt the same way I did. I'm just very grateful to have been here. Uh, very I, lucky day for me. I, I, I guess that those, those theater classes helped, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it didn't hurt. Uh, the question I had, something I resonated with very much listening to you, is. Uh, and I'm wondering whether in your research you may have discovered more than I have informally. My, I'm the product of uh, immigrants from uh, Eastern Europe, and my father wouldn't talk about anything. Their escape from Ukraine, mm -hmm. from what I understand, is owed in part or in great part to their capacity to keep secrets. Mm -hmm. And that the environment from which they came they met here, but came from the same town in Ukraine that met. Mm -hmm. Your parents. Okay, because yeah. it was a resettlement organization that was sponsored by right. that town. Sure. And so the match was made. Sure. But uh, very little information. And I read a little bit about, even as far back as the Inquisition, that secrets could keep you alive, especially if you were Jewish. Yes. In an environment which mm -hmm. wasn't unusual, they didn't mm -hmm. like Jews. Mm -hmm. An oppressive environment. I'm wondering to what extent the uh, reticence of your father, albeit owed significantly to his experience during that time and capture, uh, might have been owed to cultural uh, 
uh, aspect of secrets. Mm -hmm. right. The Jews in Eastern Europe. Sure. That men kept secrets. My mother kept secrets. Yeah. Too. And they escaped. Right. Well, I'm just wondering whether in your research you um, came upon that. I can just tell you about uh, with my, my father's upbringing. My grandmother, who was a real product of the old world environment and breeding, she, she kind of instilled in him the idea not to make waves, you know, and to keep secrets held close. So it's, it's, def, it's probably something maybe she learned from her family or, and the environment that which, which she grew up in because that was, he, it was very hard for him to open up, I guess when he was younger, later on, you know, he, he opened up you know, a little bit, like to my mother and myself, in environments where he felt safe or he was with people whom he trusted. Uh, certainly with the, uh, fellow Holocaust survivors, yes. Oh yeah. But I, I, do th I think that was probably a cultural thing that you're talking about, that uh, just being reticent, keeping things close to the heart, um, not making waves. Don't draw attention to yourself. And in a very perverse way, I always think that that, kind of, that might have helped him survive, being anonymous, not drawing attention to yourself. Got captured because typically 12 years old, they don't, they're not put to work. So, like, how did he get captured and separated? Okay. Interesting. Yes, yes. Excuse me. Okay. Oh, I, I did. I did. That's my mother. <laughs> okay. Because um, I, I touched upon it very briefly. On October 1943, Yom Kippur Eve, uh, the SS arrested my grandmother, his two sisters, and my father, and they sent them to Kaiserwald, which was a concentration camp in Riga. And when they got there, the, they were, the, men, were forced, the men were separated from the women. And my, fa my, bro my father was 12 years old, and he didn't want to go with the other men. He was still a little boy. He wanted to go be with my, my grandmother and, uh, and my aunts. But my grandmother was very smart, and she knew that if he stayed with them, he probably would die, and probably all of them would die. She was just, she was trying to save him. Uh, because children, <laughs> uh, according, children, according to the Third Reich, they weren't exactly uh, essential workers. And it, it's, I mean, I mean, you could tell a lot about a society by the way they treat their children and their elderly, and the Third Reich didn't treat their children or the elderly or disabled very well. I mean, they immediately had them killed if they couldn't work. But, you know, she basically forced him, yelled at him to get on to that, um, to that line with the men. Yeah. Uh, my dad told me that the guard asked all these men you know, what do you do? What's your trade? And then when it got to my father, dad said that he was an apprentice. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, I, and that in a way that kind of saved him. But dad also said that had he been like just a year younger, he's, he's pretty sure he would have been killed. Any other questions? Yes. Um, along that lines, I, I, I just saw a very interesting movie um, and there are so many movies that are uh, have interesting stories of the Holocaust. I just have to grab this at the library called The Sack of Marbles, and it's a French movie. But it's it's the perspective of, and it's a true story of two, um, now, two uh, survivors, but they were children at the time, and um, in, in France, in Paris. And, uh, you know, they their parents sent them out at night to, work, to catch a train. Mm -hmm. to go to the uh, the safety zone by Nice. I mean, they had to be separated from mm -hmm. the family. The same thing, just like what you were talking about. But it's interesting because along the way, they encountered certain people that really were uh, just freaky things that helped them to survive, like like a doctor who happened to be, who, who examined them for circumcision, and he happened to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And he said, my name is Rosen, I'm going to be, you know, sent to a camp soon, but 
he, he made a statement that they were circumcised for medical reasons, mm -hmm. not for religious reasons. You know, there were different things that happened. I'm wondering if anything happened along the way with your father that he talked, you know, that you found out about that, um, besides what you said already, that we are, really were just helpful in well, survival. Well, I did mention um, he had a really beautiful voice. And uh, he, he sang in a choir in Latvia, and he also sang in a ghetto uh, because there was this gentleman who, uh, who uh, was a friend, family friend, who, uh, and there's a character in there that's inspired, in my book that's inspired by him, who used to put on these reviews. You know, he, was a, he was a shoemaker, but sort of like an amateur song and dance man, as my father would say. And he continued to put on these little reviews even when they were in the camps. Mm -hmm. And dad used to say that it helped him in the sense that when he was getting food, they would remember him and they would right. just and they would give him more food. They would say, "Oh, you're that kid who sings. Very nice, very nice." And he would get an extra portion. Yeah. So that 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 helped him. Did he develop relationships in any of the camps? Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. He he was yes. He developed a lifelong relationships with the. Uh, with other people he met in the camp. Some of them were people whom he knew from his hometown, and also um, some of them were people whom he knew from his hometown. And also, uh, they were uh, there were a few. Like there was one, there was young young boy who was about his age who uh, lost everyone. He was German, and he became a very good friend of my dad. And he he helped my dad out. He, my dad was a very good, very well-behaved boy, and this boy was like like the artful dodger. You know, he would get involved with these groups where they would just steal things. Like, there was this, this older man who just kind of recruited this, my father's friend Jackie, and they, were just, they would just steal everything. And it, it was just, it was amazing that he didn't get hanged. Other people got hanged for things that Jackie did, but Jackie would always, like, when he would get some, steal some food, he would give some to my father because my father certainly wasn't going to do this. So, um, but yes, he he had lifelong relationships with a lot of people that he met in camps, and also there were a lot of people there whom he knew from his hometown. There was um, one person. Um, in, well, there were because he was a young boy. There were a lot of older people whom he knew who would take care of my dad, uh, particularly this one woman who really took care of him, who really saved his life a few times when the guards were going to take him away, you know, and she would bribe the guards with like a jewel that she hid. And uh, in a way, she became like my father's surrogate mother. And this is kind of sad, but after my father had been reunited with his mother and his, two, and his sister and his, uh, and all, well, his sister, um, the, the bond that he had with his mother wasn't really there anymore. It had been replaced by this woman who took care of my dad. And she later, she went to Israel. And when, when we were kids, when like I was a kid, and we would go to Israel, she was still alive, we would call her Sapta, which is, grandma, which is grandmother in Hebrew. We would call her the Sapta of Renana. And, you know, and, just, and it's funny, when my book came out, her grandson, who lives in LA, he found out about it. And he, he came here uh, when he was working on a project. And my mother and I, we saw him a few times. And we were talking a lot about how, my, how his grandmother would just, uh, she, would ha she would rejoice. It would be like a celebration when my father would come to Israel. Because she just saw him as like her son, even though she didn't give birth to him. But, you know, but the thing is, like again, like I mentioned, um, Dad felt emotionally estranged from his own mother, who's a nice woman, but he just, he, and he always, even though she, she tried to protect him, that's why she wanted him to get on that line, he never forgave her. Never. He never, he always thought that she abandoned him, even though he knew intellectually she was saving his life. It's just, there was, a, I think there was another, yes. When you were growing up, do you remember, did your father read newspapers? Oh, God, voraciously, voraciously. What, what did he read? <laughs> he loved the New York Times. He loved really? the New York Times until later on in his life when he felt that they were developing an anti-Israel bias. 
but he loved the Times. My father read the Times. He did. And did he read the Times and get animated over what he read? And what animated him? Um, he just, he loved the, the writing, he loved the coverage. This was like, this was, uh, this was like years ago. Um, because I think now, because they've had, I, I've known people who worked at the Times and they have, have had so many layoffs. And uh, I, I think the copy editing is atrocious because they're hiring like these people for like, who are not really qualified to do this. Whereas years ago, they had great editing, great writers. Dad loved the writing, he loved the coverage, he loved the analysis. He could tell you who was, who was the Paris bureau chief, who was the Moscow bureau chief. I would, I would mention like, uh, oh God, I remember when there was a, a writer there named Flora Lewis. And, and I, I remember reading some of her articles thinking, God, she's a really good writer. Oh, wow. You know, and I was like thinking a little bit about being a journalist. And I mentioned this to Dad. And Dad, just, he could just give me her, he could just give me the 401 on her. Oh, yeah, she was the Paris bureau chief. And she was this and that. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, but I would, I would say the last 10 years in his life, he developed an aversion to it because he felt they were becoming increasingly anti-Israel. <laughs> Of what the Republicans had on you, because you mentioned some something about um, I, I know I'm having nightmares, but nightmares. Besides that, um, it was you see, it was very it's like I said, you know, it's um they're jarring. It's very jarring. Like for example, like when I recall, recall that conversation that I had with my dad, this silly little conversation when I was in my early 20s where I mentioned this character named Ivan, you know, that was in this Russian novel that I was reading. And I was thinking, that's such a cool name. It's like 20 years old. And then dad said to me, matter of fact, oh, I knew an Ivan once. He was a really nice guy um, in camp. He was hanged. And then he would just look at the menu. Oh, do you want any like a, an omelet? I was like, what? But this was just typical. This was typical. And the nightmares, uh, you see, it was something that I just grown, had grown used to. But I recognized that it, prob that it probably was not normal. And also he had phobias, like he couldn't be left alone. I mean, I remember one time uh, I was visiting from New York and I went with my mother to like, uh, to I guess we went to Macy's <laughs> to buy like underwear. <laughs> It's just, my father, we, he was tired, he wasn't feeling well, but he had to come with us because he couldn't be left alone. And he had to come and I was like, Dad, we're just gonna, we're just gonna, just gonna buy underwear. This, is, this would be, a, be of no interest to you whatsoever. He just could not be left alone. I mean, my mother could tell stories of just about how, he, how attached he was to her because he just, he was just terrified of it. And that, of course, had its origin in, in his being forcibly separated from his mother and his two sisters and being on his own in the camps. Um, and of course the nightmares, they were always, they were always like the same. Um, they were, he was being chased by Nazis and then sometimes loved ones would be chased by Nazis. I would be chased by Nazis, my brother, my mother, my nephews, and he would say, run, run. Thank you very much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. What, what were the size of the camps in that I mean, how many people? Oh, I thought that was my phone. <laughs> what were the size of the camps? Um, you know, I, I've, never, I've never been in Stutthof or Auschwitz, but I have been in Sachsenhausen, which is a concentration camp that's outside Berlin, like about 45 minutes uh, train ride outside Berlin. I visited okay, Berlin so, two or three okay. years ago on my own. And, I, and that was a camp that um, was actually fairly large. I can't tell you square foot and all that, but it was fairly large. And, um, and they had the Arbach macht frei. They had that on the gate, which is like, I guess, the, the inside joke, you know, which is you know, work brings freedom, which was not true. Um, but it was, I, I can't really tell you how, it was fairly large, yeah, fairly large. Did your dad have to go back to visit? <laughs> um, <laughs> not to, not to, yeah, not Berlin, um, not Germany, um, but he did go to Latvia. 
He went twice. He belonged to a group called Survivors of Latvia, which is self-explanatory. And um, he went on two trips to Latvia. One was like, what was like 19, one was 1999, or I didn't go on that one. Um, and one was, I went on, one on 2004. I went with my, my mother and my brother. And, uh, yes, yes, we went to the cemetery to, in uh, Libau where my, uh, my uncle, where my uncle, where my, my uh, paternal grandfather was buried. And because he died during, at, before the war, he had a, he had a burial site. Uh, however, we did also go to, a, we went to a beach called Skaden, where a lot of, we believe a lot of the relatives were killed. Uh, that's where a lot of Jews from Libau, Lipaya, were, were taken and they were killed and they were thrown into the water. We went there to Skaden and they had a plaque there where the Rus this is from like the occupation because Latvia had been occupied by uh, the Russians for many years. Um, and they had a plaque, now the Russians put in there just com commemorating that uh, Russian citizens had been killed there. Not Jewish, just Russian citizens. It was, very, it was very annoying to see this. But as soon as we got off the bus, and there was like about 40 people that were on this, 40, but yeah, oh, uh, there were a lot of people in this group. As, for, as soon as we got off the bus and we walked to this site, my father immediately started reciting the mourner's Kaddish, and everybody started joining in. And, and they were either killed there at Skaden or um, the forest, mm -hmm. Rumbala. Yes. How did your dad feel about serving in the military? <laughs> that's, a really, that's a really good question. He, okay. Um, I'm sure when he was going through this, it wasn't exactly like wonderful, but he didn't want to be deported, all that. But he was very proud of being an American citizen. And honestly, he was very proud afterwards, in hindsight, of having been a Marine. And on his tombstone, there is that Marine symbol. And when he died, my mother contacted, uh, I guess, the yeah. local, yeah, no, the Marines, the local Marine organization. And they came, and they, uh, yeah. And they and they and they did the ceremonial uh, flag folding, right, and uh, yeah, and then they played the, the bugle. You mentioned that your father, when he got to the family, he said he was an apprentice. Yes. Then what happened after that? Because he really didn't. Have oh skills. my God. Okay. Um, he was immediately he was sent to a camp called Stolp which in the beginning wasn't so horrendous. Later on it became horrendous. That camp, um, it, was a, it was a comprised of Germans, there were also some, some Jews who were also, who, uh, were also uh, ministering duties. It was uh, working on the railroad. And um, that was fine, you know, they had food to eat, and it just later on, conditions became increasingly dire. And uh, people, and there was the food was running out, and people were dying, and then uh, there was people were being taken away for offenses that weren't even offenses. And at this point, my dad had been sent to um, I think he'd been sent to Stutthof at this point, which was really terrible, because he said that by the time he got there, it was so terrible. Um, there were piles of corpses. Like littering the ground, and you, in order to get somewhere, you had to like walk over it. So, so one few times, he and other people would just pick up the corpses, and they would just sort of move it to the side. And he said you couldn't even, they didn't even separate the men from the women. It was so awful. Well, he was pretty clever to say that. That saved his life when he said he was an apprentice. Yes, he, yes. Oh, my dad was smart. My dad was always very, very smart. Yes, he was very clever to say that. Yes. Yeah. My, my, my mother said he spoke perfect English. He spoke perfect German at that point. But he couldn't really read and, and understand it that's, that well. So, that, so when he wrote a letter to, um, to his aunt in, in Germany, in Berlin, he had a friend of his who could write German, who did it for him. Sorry. 
Yes, uh, I have to know. How did your parents meet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the Reader's Digest version. Uh, my, it was about 1956. Uh, my father had been working at Bogue Electric in Patterson. He quit the job because he, he was been there for a while. He wanted to visit his cousin. Um, who had been living in, in Israel since uh, his liberation. Uh, his cousin tried to get him to join this, this young Zionist group, but dad just didn't like being regimented, and I think after like two or three nights he ran away. But his, his cousin Reuven he went to Israel, and he has, you know, raised a family there, so he wanted to see Reuven. He loved Reuven. He loved Reuven. And, and he was a wonderful man, too, really nice man. So um, Reuven <laughs> knew my mother, and he knew my mother's mother, you know, my grandmother, my Sapta. He knew her. He, he'd worked with them. But I think the first night that my dad had been in, in Israel, they were walking down some street in Herzliya, and they saw my mother, and she was on a bicycle. <laughs> and uh, my mother kind of knew that uh, she knew who Reuben was, um, and she knew that Reuben's cousin from America w had been visiting. And they int he introduced her to uh, his cousin. And then, um, oh God, later on, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to just uh, bridge this. What? Okay, okay. Later on, okay. Um, oh. Uh, 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 it's such a long story, uh, but later on, uh, my my uh, my father my father met uh, my mother's uh, mother, who was go all oh, she was, it was a couple of days later. They were going to a memorial for Latvian Jews that was held like in Hertz in Hertz in Tel Aviv in Tel Aviv, and she um, she uh, she uh, invited my father and Reuven to come to the house. And uh, my mother stayed away uh, that one time because she thought that she didn't like the idea that they were trying to make a Shidic match. <laughs> but um, th I think it was like the next day or whatever. Reuven had hired someone. Reuven had, had uh, just—he wanted to show my father the sights, and he invited my mother to come along. And perhaps you know, an Israeli, she could show my know my dad and Reuven the sights, and that's what happened. And sparks flew. <laughs> and uh, they married in they yeah they married in March 1956. No, sorry, they met in March 1956. You're right. She, my mother was a teenager. She re, she was a young woman, and dad was young too. And uh, uh, they got married in July, July 30th. And uh, that's uh, that's that's what happened. Oh yes, this is very interesting. Uh, what a small world things are, especially what a small world Latvia is, particularly Libau, which is Dad's hometown. Uh, my my mother's mother, my Sapta, uh, she was from Libau, and she knew my father's um, grandmother. It's it's such it's a long story. My father's, uh, and she also knew my fa my uh, my father's mother. She knew her. What happened was that she was an orphan. Um, her her parents or her mother died in childbirth, and the father died like a couple of months later of an illness, and they didn't know what to do with her. And she was sent to live with with uh, these older aunts who were very nice, but they died. And then she was sent to live with other relatives, and uh, they they were very abusive towards her. And my uh, this my my father's uh, grandmother knew her and felt really sorry for her. And she would um, make her, what did she, she made her, she would make her soup, she would give her food and everything, she took care of her, and also, so did my grandmother. So it was kind of ironic that, yes, yes, and, and, when, and when my father met my grandmother, when they were going to this memorial, she asked him, you know, she, she found out he was also from the same hometown, and she asked him, tell me, do you know what happened to a, a very good friend of mine? Her name was Hannah Dorbian, which was my father's mother. My father was always like this. And my father said, yes, I, I know who that is. And she says, how? How do you know her? She's my mother. <laughs> She's alive. <laughs> She's in Patterson. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Oh, 
Oh my God. Um, all right. Okay. My my mother's father. His name was Eliyahu. He um, he came to was then Palestine in the late 1920s. He was a Zionist, and he was a he really believed strongly in Zionism. He came from Dvinsk, um, which is Latvia. Right? Yeah, and he felt. He was very influenced by Herzl's, Theodor Herzl's writings, Theodor Herzl who popularized uh, Zionism, uh, modern Zionism, and he felt that Jews had no future in Europe. Ba and he felt this based on, all, based on the discrimination that he saw going around him in the pogroms. So he became a Zionist, really staunch committed Zionist, and he, he emigrated to Palestine when it was just a desert, when there was nothing there, no electricity, no water, nothing. And my grandmother, who was the orphan, she wasn't so much a Zionist, it's just she didn't have anything else in Latvia. And she, she thought this might give her uh, some sort of future because she certainly didn't have that in Latvia. So she joined these, the Zionist youth group and she emigrated like in the early 1930s and she met my, my grandfather in a kibbutz. So. Any, any other questions? <clears throat> well, well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for asking all those questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and I really hope you'll come back this Wednesday and next Monday, and check out our website. If you know anybody who's interested in our Speakers Bureau, let me know. So, thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.